moderate abolitionist by political persuasion. He helped defend several runaway slaves and was instrumental in desegregating the horse-drawn trolley system in New York City. He was also a very early activist in the New York State Republican Party. During the Civil War, Arthur was appointed to be quartermaster general in charge of supplying the New York State volunteers with uniforms, equipment, weapons, and ammunition. He performed this huge administrative task with efficiency and scrupulous honesty. It led to him earning a place for himself in the hierarchy of the state Republican organization after the war. In 1871, he was appointed collector of the Port of New York, a position that was notorious for graft and corruption, uh, but he administered his uh, duties there with honesty and integrity. Over time, he performed political work for the New York State Republican Party, and in particular, its leader, Roscoe Conkling. When James Garfield was nominated for president in 1880, Arthur was chosen as the vice presidential candidate to placate the Conkling faction of the National Party. Six months after being elected, of course, Garfield was assassinated, and Chester Allen Arthur became the 21st president of the United States. As president, Garfield put aside his stalwart Conkling faction friends and committed his administration to moderate reforms and maintaining the dignity of the presidential office. He renovated the White House with his own funds. I will mention the huge Tiffany Wall, Tiff, uh, Lewis Comfort Tiffany Wall that he had installed there. there there's photographs of it, it's gorgeous. Um, off on a private tangent. Uh, and But he entertained guests in the White House in an opulent but tasteful style. He vigorously prosecuted frauds that had been uncovered during the Garfield administration, although the government failed to obtain many convictions on that. As president, Arthur signed the Pendleton Act, which prohibited soliciting federal employees for political contributions. He also created the Civil Service Commission. This, of course, infuriated the conflict faction of the Republican Party, to whom you know, uh, the spoils belonged to the victor. President Arthur presided over the dedications of both the Washington Monument and the Brooklyn Bridge. His reforms and modernization of the United States Navy have earned for him the title, the father of the modern Navy. Chester Arthur died of nephritis on November the 18th, 1886. He is interned here in uh, uh, Albany World, behind this monument, beside his wife, Ellen Herndon. His memorial is one of the most interesting and artistic monuments in the cemetery. The memorial was designed by Ephraim Kayser of New York City. It was erected in 1889 at a cost of just over $10,000, which calculates to close to $300,000 today. The sarcophagus is highly polished dark granite, with a bronze angel of sorrow who is seen placing a palm branch on top of the sarcophagus, the branch, of course, uh, signifying uh, uh, victorious triumph and peace and eternal life. That is Chester Allen Arthur. Thank you, Michael. Uh, I 
I had asked Jack McEnany to come down and give those historical remarks, and uh, about a week ago he had to bow out, so I want to thank Michael for stepping in at the last minute. At this time, I'd like to introduce Major General Michael McCallie. <coughs> Good morning. I'm Major General Michael Natale, and on behalf of the President of the United States, President Joseph R. Biden, and the Adjutant General of the State of New York, Major General Raymond Shields, it is my honor to commemorate the 193rd birthday of the 21st President of the United States, Chester A. Arthur. The tradition for the currently serving President of the United States to honor the service of former Commanders-in-Chief started in 1967 during the administration of Lyndon Johnson. This, ob this observance is particularly meaningful to us as President Arthur was a native of the Capital Region and also prior to his entry into political life, he was a prominent member of the New York State Militia, the forerunner to today's New York Army National Guard. During the Civil War years, his military service as the state's chief engineer included the supervision of the construction and maintenance of fortifications guarding New York Harbor. Achieving the rank of Brigadier General, he also served as Inspector General, and finally as Quartermaster General with the responsibility of all aspects of logistics, supporting the nearly 300 regiments and approximately 400,000 soldiers that New York State sent to fight in the Civil War. Before his life as a public servant, he was an accomplished attorney. And of note, he became involved in precedent-setting civil rights case in 1854. In that particular matter, he successfully represented a plaintiff who experienced racial discrimination at the hands of a New York City horse cart operator. His arguments correctly pointed out that it was illegal for the streetcar company to segregate passengers based on race. His efforts are thought to have contributed to the complete desegregation of the public transit system in New York by the year 1861. Chester Arthur was elected to the vice presidency in 1880 and became president upon President James Garfield's assassination in the summer of 1881. Overall, his presidency is regarded as one of relative stability during a tumultuous time in American history. At the time, the spoil system, or the awarding of positions of influence within government in exchange for political support, was fairly common. As we heard earlier, Arthur's administration reformed the civil service system and gave impetus to merits-based employment practices at the state and local levels. According to a biography from a book entitled The Presidents of the United States of America, Chester A. Arthur demonstrated that he was above the factions that existed within the Republican Party. And it was said by publisher Alexander McClure that no man had ever entered the presidency so profoundly and widely distrusted and no one ever retired more generally respected. He also initiated the modernization of the United States Navy, uh, thereby enhancing America's strategic capabilities and global, global influence. Secretary of State, or I'm sorry, Secretary of War Elihu Root described Arthur as, quote, wise in statesmanship and firm and effective in administration. So for everyone here today, thank you for taking the time to share in this commemoration and to recognize the legacy and contributions of President Chester A. Arthur to our state, to our nation, and to our common heritage. Thank you. Thank you, General. Before I ask uh, General Natale to Command Sergeant Major, Major Jenks to place the wreath, I want to remind everybody, tax is going to be played and the same flag etiquette is requested of everyone. So at this time, uh, if Major General Natale and Command Sergeant Major Robert Jenks, please place this uh, ceremonial wreath. Mm -hmm.
have heard from a couple of our speakers of President Arthur's involvement in the Civil War as a Brigadier General. To honor him as a Civil War soldier, I now invite the Colonel George L. Willard, Camp Number 154, Sons of Union Veterans, to please step forward and place your ceremonial wreath at the uh, sarcophagus. concludes today's proceedings. Anybody that's interested in the Friends of Albany Rural Cemetery joining or maybe uh, looking at some volunteer work, please stop at the blue tent and talk to the lady behind the table. Um, with that, I thank you all and have a good day. Stick them on flicker and dim stuff. Excuse me, man. No, I was, I was, yeah, I was, I was actually. Oh, okay. Uh, so yeah, I was. Uh,